Hey, Alicia. Hello, how are you? I'm well, thank you. Sorry, I'm a little bit late here. I had to come from a, a different meeting. That's fine. I've been very busy, well, so. <laughs> Evelyn, can you hear us? No? Um, where's that little thing that says video? It should uh, be at the bottom of your screen there. It says start video. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. okay. Perfect. Okay, you can, can see, see us? me. Okay. Yeah. All Great. right. Um, let's see here. Uh, first, uh, let's make sure, um, Alicia, do you want to try your um, PowerPoint? Sure. Let's see. I'll, let me make sure. Um, okay, there. Should be the co-host now. How's that working? Perfect. Let's see. Great. All right. Um, now. Now I would like to introduce our presenters for today. First is Evelyn Doyle. Evelyn is an original docent of the Michener Art Museum. Evelyn told us before that during the early days of the museum, the docents did everything including hanging the exhibits. Wow, I'd love to have been there. Uh, Evelyn has also served on various committees representing the museum. Evelyn, thank you for joining us today. Hi. Next, we have Dr. Alicia Shenko. Dr. Alicia Shenko teaches in Delaware Valley University's Department of Animal and Biotechnology and Conservation. Dr. Schenko gained her PhD in ecology and evolution from Rutgers University. She also holds an MS in environmental science with a specialization in conservation biology from Drexel University, as well as a BS in environmental science from Drexel University. Some of her interests include the role of small mammals in wetland conservation and restoration and the New Jersey pine lands. Dr. Alicia, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. Fantastic. All right, let's get right to this. Uh, Alicia, do you want to share your screen? Sure. Okay. Okay, so I guess you could all see my screen now. Is that true? I'm assuming so. Um, okay, so um, today I wanted to talk to you all about um, mammals and climate change and diversity um, and how all of that kind of plays together um, and kind of influences our world. Um, my specialty is, is mammals, um, particularly small ones. Um, and so that's kind of what I want to bring to light for you guys is how important a lot of these mammal communities are to us um, and how the climate really impacts what we see um, and how things change over time. Um, let's go ahead. Oh, let's, how do I? Aha. Okay. Um, and so, um, just a little bit of background for, for you guys. Uh, mammals arose um, in our evolutionary history uh, in the Mesozoic era, really. I mean, we have some evidence for them a little earlier um, with our smallest, most um, basic mammals maybe appearing and overlapping with the dinosaurs a little bit. Um, but in general, mammals really started to flourish and diversify after the dinosaurs. And you can kind of see um, that their, their locomotor mode or the way that they, they move hasn't really changed that much over time. But their body size um, since the dinosaurs has really expanded in diversity, um, their dietary preferences have really expanded and flourished, um, much like our flowering plants and things like that. Um, so we really see the, the end of the dinosaurs as the beginning of mammal diversity. Um, and over time, um, I kind of, I don't, I don't necessarily 
um, expect you guys to memorize any sort of mammalian evolutionary um, overlaps or whatnot, but just kind of how things are related. Um, and so if you look at that uh, tree diagram um, labeled B, um, that's what we call a cladogram or a phylogeny. And what it does is show the relationships uh, between different groups of mammals. And so mammals that are closer together um, in the little brackets are more closely related and mammals that are farther apart in the brackets are less closely related, right? So if you look um, the very, we kind of read the tree, um, I'm gonna read the tree from this area here. Um, and so it starts there um, with, let me get a color you can actually see. Um, so it starts here um, with, you know, our most recent ancestor between all of the mammals. Um, and then um, what we then see is a diversity here where mammals branch out, right? And we get our monotremes, right? And these are our egg-laying mammals. So you think echidna, think platypus, right? Um, and then it branches over to here, right? Where we've got a note of division between the marsupials, our pouched mammals, right? Um, and placentals, everything else. Um, and so that's really the major split. And then you can kind of see it gets more and more um, related to each other. So here we've got things like manatees being really closely related to elephants over here, right? And things like mm, bats. This is a bat, trust me, it's a bat. Um, and, you know, much more closely related to things like lions, right, um, than they are to something like a um, manatee, right? Um, and so that's kind of what I, I just wanted to kind of for you guys to kind of picture when I talk about mammals changing and diversifying over time, right, they've done a lot of that. Um, and so some are more closely related to others, but really we're talking about you know, things that are affecting their change and how they interact with their environment um, to really see some changes. Uh, let me see if I can click back over here. Oh no, how do I get rid of the, hold on, deep base, clear, clear, there we go. Um, and so, um, all right, so when we talk about that, right, when we think of animals in the world, we, we kind of think of this map, right, where if we're looking for elephants, we're going to look in Africa, we're going to look in uh, Southeast Asia, right, and if we're going to look for primates, we're going to look in Africa, we're going to look in, in Asia in general, right, um, and if we're going to look for something like a kangaroo, we're going to look in Australia, right, um, but how do those animals kind of get to where they are, and the best evidence we have is it's a trifecta of plate tectonics, right? So all of our continents used to be together um, in the, the continent called Pangaea or the supercontinent. And then as the earth changed, right, our continents slowly started moving apart. Um, they're still moving. Um, that's not something that's changed. They move, what's the latest, I think, the, the statistic is they move about the width of a fingernail um, every year. Um, so it's not something that happens super fast. We're not going to like look and see Australia moving away, right? Um, but we do see it over a period of time. Um, and so they're still moving apart, but this is our current snapshot uh, of what things look like. And so it's plate tectonics, right? Um, climate, um, which really is the impact factor of, you know, where animals can live based on their physiology. Um, and then mountains. Mountains seem to be really big. Um, delineators because going up and over a mountain is really hard for most mammals, right? Um, it's actually harder for some mammals to go up and over a mountain than it is to like cross a river or cross an ocean, right? Because they can like hold on to something and float across, right? Um, we always think of the that classic example of like a little mouse like clutching onto a coconut to get to the next island, um, which doesn't really work for uh, mountains. Um, and so that we have a plate tectonics, our mountains and our climate has really shaped the way that terrestrial mammals um, inhabit the world, right? Um, and I have uh, some citations up here for um, some of uh, some what I would call the more important articles. Um, and I actually am gonna grab this real quick and toss it into the chat. Um, doo -doo -doo. And this is a link to a shared document that I made for you guys that has the links to all of our, what I would call really important articles that I've linked here today. So it's not all the articles I've linked, um, but some of the ones if you're interested in doing some reading later, 
um, that you can get a hold of. Um, most of them, I think, are available for free online. Um, so you can go ahead and read those articles if it's something that interests you. Um, so we have this idea of climate tectonics and mountains. And so climate's really the one I want to focus on uh, because plate tectonics is really not my thing. I'm not a, I'm not a um, paleogeographer um, and I'm not really, uh, I don't really like mountains. They're really hard to climb. I don't like going up mountains. Um, so we're just gonna focus on climate. Uh, plus it kind of deals with our um, theme for, for the day um, in our climate talks. So when we talk about mammals, what we can really identify is what we call zoogeographic regions. And these have been revised over time um, but this is the most updated um, version of what we call our zoo geographic regions. Um, and what we're seeing here is the colors denote mammals that are more closely related to each other, right? So if you look at North America, it's a dark blue color. Um, and if you look at Northern Asia right, and Northern Europe, they're also the similar dark blue color. So mammals in North America are more closely related to those in Europe and Northern Asia um, than they are to those in South America, right? Because they're hot pink. Meanwhile, the mammals in Northern South America um, are more closely related to those in Middle South America, right? Um, and so what we're seeing with these colors are different regions and, and areas where mammals are more closely related. And so when we see a pattern like this, and by the way, the dots are Antarctica because um, nobody really studies mammals there. Um, they're all under the ice. Um, and so um, when we see a pattern like this, like what does this color pattern signify to you? Like where have you, where have you seen this before? What, what do we, what are we seeing here, right? And you know, when you think about it, you might see kind of going across the middle of something we call the equator, right? And if you look at our latitudes, right? Longitudes go this way, they're long, right? And latitudes lay flat, right? Um, and so our latitudes going across horizontally um, are, our relation to the sun. And that's really our climate patterns and our temperature patterns are more related to each other across latitudinal lines than there are longitudinal lines. And so when we see the latitudinal line across North America, right, those are similarly related colors, right? Although you may see that, you know, if you go south, south to South America and you go straight across, you hit green and then brown, right? And that's not similar. Um, and the reason for that is because when those, those um, tectonic plates moved, right? They moved into different climate regions. And so we also have species having an inability to move really, right? And so when Australia broke off, right? That's where all of our marsupials are. There are some marsupials in South America because I think what sometimes people forget is this is the earth is not flat, right? So if you take both ends and you wrap it around, right? Australia touches South America. Um, in fact, let me do my little annotation here again. Um, if you take this coast of Australia, it magically lines up to this coast of South America, right? Because we have to wrap it around. Um, and so um, we see that actually our marsupials are more related, right, to those marsupials in um, South America, right? And that there are South American marsupials. Um, and so kind of thinking of that um, and how those animals are related to each other. And so when the climate changes and ice ages happen, um, we look at species and, and we can see that the way that they move across the landscape because their relation to the sun changes, right? Their temperature around them changes and their physiology changes, right? So if you prefer to be, as a human, prefer to be in a warmer climate, right? Um, let's say as you get older in age, you may no longer like the cold winters and may move south to Florida to maintain a more warm temperature, right? So an animal that prefers warm temperatures may run ahead of an ice sheet, right? Because they don't want to be involved in the ice, right? And so there's no sound associated with this, so don't worry about hearing anything. I just wanna kind of play for you what it looks like, um, what it has looked like over time in North America as the ice sheets have changed and moved. Um, because we have these things called, naturally called Milankovitch cycles, um, which have to do um, with, it's a really physics based thing where the sun or the earth rotates around the sun and wobbles at the same time and then changes from a circle to an oval. And so what that does is change how much sun we get 
and how the earth reflects that heat. Um, and so what we have is a cyclical over 20,000 years or so pattern um, where we have glaciation events that cover parts of our landmass um, and then receding of the glaciers as the earth warms. And this is a normal climate cycle. Um, and that doesn't mean that climate change um, and, and anthropogenic factors aren't involved, they are, um, but our climate naturally changes, right? Climate change um, is something that we can document over the history of Earth. Um, and so if we see that, ah. okay, what's happening? Just play it again, um, thank you. Um, and so we can see, right, that with those cycles, right, that ice sheet is changing. And so we can assume that species that live on the edge of that ice sheet, right, would run in front of it because they don't want to get covered with ice, right? And species that would prefer to be in a warm climate, right, would go further south as the ice sheet descended and then continue further north as the ice sheet receded, right? And this is what we call normal patterns in species change. And so when we look at that, um, what does that really look like? And so what I kind of want you to think about is in a regional species pool, right? Or an area where you have this whole suite of animals, right? The ability for those animals to run and move ahead of climate or to run and move ahead of other species, right? Depends on the animal itself. Can it fly? Can it move 20 miles in a day, right? Is it have, does it have legs that are this big? And so moving a mile is gonna take a day, right? Um, and then it's never going to move 20 miles away because it just can't do it. Um, and so you have those kind of dispersal ranges and chances for dispersal um, that are then come up against this environmental wall, right? The animal wants to move, right? But it can't because there's a biotic factor, right? Like a river right, or an abiotic factor, like the oxygen level is not good, right? They can't go up and over a mountain because the oxygen um, gets too low for them. Um, and so once they hit that wall, then they kind of are in little pockets. And so if you can imagine species B, D, F, I, and J, right, go through that wall, um, and mostly F, I, and J survive and interact with each other, right? Uh, but B and D didn't quite make it through on that side. Right? And then they interact with each other. And so we end up having these little regions right, of, of species or local species pools um, that allow for change in our environment. And so this is a really important factor because species have to move because our earth is always changing. Right? And so we run into problems when they can no longer move. Um, and so what I have for you, unfortunately, I couldn't find a good example of a mammal for you. Um, this is an African bullfrog. Um, but if you look at its range in Africa, the dark blue, right, is its biogeographical range, right, or the areas in which it could possibly live, right, where it has the right habitat for that species, right. Then if we look, it's more restricted to the dark green, um, because that's its regional scale or the extent of its occurrence where even though it could live in that blue region, there's some reason, something stopping it from encompassing that entire blue region that's restricted to that darker green region. And then if we look at that darker green region and zoom in a little bit more, right? These African bullfrogs are not um, occupying that entire green region. They're actually only occupying these little pockets of yellow dots within that green region, right? Um, and that's because of water or uh, sunlight or maybe predators, right, or maybe other species that they're competing with um, for food or shelter. Um, and so within this whole biogeographical scale that they could possibly live in, they actually only occupy these really tiny spaces, right. Um, and so when you think of that um, and, and how that animal is going to move around and, and what it means um, for that species to really kind of move with the environment, um, understanding that it can't occupy its entire range um, is really kind of an important factor there. So when I at, talk to you about North American mammals or mammals in Pennsylvania, um, this is usually what people think of, right? Um, if you're there, can I get a, a thumbs up if this is what you think of for mammals? 
Good, I'm seeing some thumbs ups. Excellent, excellent, right? Um, and so people think of, you know, moose and deer and bear and, and waterfowl. Um, and that's what, that's what you think of. Um, but, you know, our most common mammals here in Pennsylvania, primarily Bucks County, right, are these guys, right? You've got your possums, right? You've got coyotes, lots of coyotes, lots of foxes, deer, obviously, raccoons, um, skunks, woodchucks or groundhogs, depending on what part of Pennsylvania you come from. Um, we actually have two different species of rabbit. We have Appalachian and Cottontail. Um, and we have two different species of skunk. We've got striped and spotted. Um, we've got gray squirrels, red squirrels, um, beavers, chipmunks. We've got flying squirrels, right? But these are our most common animals. Um, and when you look at the most common animals in Bucks County, what you actually find is, is rodents are number one, right? Um, rodents are actually the largest order of mammals. 42% of all living mammals are rodents. Um, they're globally distributed except Antarctica, um, New Zealand, um, and um, some oceanic islands don't quite have rodents yet. Um, most are tiny. Um, the largest rodent is the capybara, right? They live in Brazil, 110 pounds um, they cap out at. And the smallest mammal is actually a shrew, and it weighs about two tenths of a, well, but it weighs about two tenths of a pound or so. It, it weighs like seven grams, so whatever that is. Um, and so in Pennsylvania, you can actually find them in four different families, right? Um, which doesn't mean much to most people, but to people who study mammals, it's kind of cool because that talks about how they're related to each other. Um, but most of the rodents in Pennsylvania are crusetids. Um, then we've got ones that hop called depotids. Um, and then we have our non-natives that came over from Europe. Those are murids. Then all of our squirrel-like creatures um, are sirens. I'm going to go briefly through here because I can see in the chat that foxes and raccoons are popular. Um, but I, of course, as a small animal connoisseur, uh, want to show you the full diversity of what could be in your backyard. These are all native to Bucks County. Um, right? Oh, I forgot to say, what are we actually talking about here? We're talking about mice, right? All kinds of different mice. And some people have this opinion, right, when they see a mouse. Um, I actually had uh, someone over my house the other day that had this reaction to my cat. Um, which was interesting, um, but this could be a reaction. This is more of my reaction, and I was told by a friend that that doesn't look like me at all anymore. It looks like my son because apparently I'm old now, so that's nice. Um, but this is me with a vole, particularly a bog lemming, uh, hanging out on my shoulder because it was cold, right? Um, yeah, he, they're super cute. Um, and so, but just as a relation, I like this picture because of size, right? You can see how small they really are. Um, and they're really important um, to the food web because they take the grass, right? And they turn it into energy that everything else can use, right? Um, they can actually disperse seeds, right? By eating them and pooping them out somewhere else or by gathering them and moving them somewhere else. Um, and then they can actually be what's called um, ecosystem engineers, right? By eating seedlings, right? And being able to stop a grassland from turning into a forest, but just by eating all the seedlings, right? So a lot of the native grasslands we have around here are due to the fact that voles like to eat seedlings um, and they, they maintain that habitat themselves, right? So here are some, right? This is the full scale of mammals in Bucks County. You've got the rodents and the insectivores, right? And you've got all of your crucidids, depotids, right? Murids, sirids, right? shrews and moles, right? And here we go, here's our paramiscus mice. You may see these in your garage, right? They're almost always the white-footed mouse. Um, white-footed mice like to inhabit garages more than deer mice. Um, deer mice you're more likely to see, but they look very similar. And I challenge anyone to tell the difference between the two of them without looking at their teeth. Um, so, but they have, you know, that, that characteristic brown on top, white on the bottom. And if they're all gray, they're usually juveniles. Um, so juveniles are all, and they'll eat everything from pasta to Cheetos. Um, although I can tell you specifically that garden salsa flavored sun chips are the most toxic to them because I have found several dead ones in my garage after eating, um, like dead in the bag of garden salsa 
some chips. So if anybody's looking for a particularly good uh, rodenticide, I would go with garden salsa flavored sun chips. Um, dipoded mice, which are adorable because they hop, right? So if you look, their tails, see how big their tails are? Their tails are usually three times the length of their body and their foot is usually twice the length or half the length of their body, their back foot. Um, and so they hop, right? Um, and they, unlike all other rodents in um, North America, they truly hibernate, right? Um, so they will actually go into a full hibernation around October and not emerge until um, March. Um, so they should be down now. So if you see anything hopping around the forest now, it's not the jumping mouse. And we have two species, uh, meadow jumping mice and woodland jumping mice, uh, characteristically named for where they prefer to be. Um, then you've got some voles, which are not moles, totally different, right? Voles are more closely related to uh, mice than they are to moles. Um, they primarily eat vegetation, right? But they'll also take your Cheerios if you leave them out. Um, a lot of people have trouble with these guys in their gardens and they blame moles for it. Um, but if they're eating your tulips, it's probably a vole. Um, and we've got th four different species around here, woodland voles, meadow voles, redback voles, and sometimes southern bog lemmings, although we'll get into why they're weird a little bit later. Um, and so we also have our large non-rat rats. Um, so the Allegheny wood rat, which is threatened around here, you can see them usually up in um, rocky regions. So think places like um, Ricketts Glen or uh, Ringing Rocks and things like that, where there's big rocky outcroppings. And then our friend, the muskrat, um, which you can see, but these are technically cursitted rats, but not actually rats. Um, and then here's the rats. Um, these are our non-native rats and mice that came from Europe, um, most often found in city areas. They don't compete well with our native paramiscus. Um, and so you'll usually find them in areas where paramiscus doesn't want to be. Um, and then you have all of our squirrels, like uh, chipmunks, gray squirrels, fox squirrels, um, red squirrels. Fox squirrels are southeastern Pennsylvania. You can find them. Um, not really in Bucks County, but sometimes it's really hard to tell the difference between the two of them um, unless you have them side by side because fox squirrels just look like beefier gym versions of gray squirrels. Um, and then you have, we have southern flying squirrels, very common here, um, and northern flying squirrels are endangered in Pennsylvania, um, but you can find them in Bucks County in certain areas. Um, but if you hang bird feeders out, check them at night, and you'll usually find flying squirrels on them. Um, then we have, this is all the shrews we have. I didn't give, get you pictures of all the shrews because they pretty much all look the same. Um, they either look like the masked shrew, right, or the short-tailed shrew. And there's only one that looks like the short-tailed shrew. That's the short-tailed shrew. It's like gray, fuzzy, has like venomous um, bite to it. It can envenomate its prey. Um, but the rest of them all look like the masked shrew. Um, so good luck telling the difference between those even when you have the teeth. Um, and then you've got our three types of moles, the hairy-tailed mole, the eastern mole, and everyone's favorite, the star-nosed mole, um, that uses all of those tentacles around its face to be able to feel for its food. Um, so if you ever want to see something fun, go ahead and YouTube star-nosed mole feeding, um, and you'll you usually get a bunch of videos of it swimming underwater um, and its tentacles going. So, but they're they're pretty big; they're not small. Um, and so I said we revisit the southern bog lemming, right? Um, and so this is the range, the, the species, the genus of the southern log, bog lemming is synaptomies. Um, and what we've seen is that it's called an arctic remnant because it typically inhabits, if you look at synaptomies borealis, the northern um, lemming, it is restricted to really cold regions, right? Right in the north, right? Northern Canada, Alaska, right? Very tip of the US, right? Um, and what the bog lemming did was as the glaciers descended across North America, the bog lemmings ran in front of the glaciers. Um, and they got all the way down to, if you look at the range of Snapneys cuprae, the southern lemming, right? It got all the way down to the coast of um, North America, right? Down into Georgia and Virginia um, and all of those states. And then as the glaciers receded, right? The bog lemming had found habitats over time that it could survive in. And so it didn't follow the glaciers back up as they receded, right? It stayed. 
And so where you find bog lemmings today, right, are areas that look like Alaska, right? Um, I had the privilege pre-corona to like travel, you know, that's, I'm not sure if you remember what that is. That's when you like leave your house and go places. Um, but I had the privilege of traveling and I, I went to Alaska and I was studying as part of my master's thesis, Southern bog lemmings and where they inhabit New Jersey, right? And they live in these really swampy places um, that has a lot of sphagnum moss, right? Cedar trees, everything's wet and mosquito filled. Um, and I went to Alaska for a different reason. Um, and I decided to rent a car and drive around to see Alaska. And I got out of the car in this one spot and I'm like, this looks like New Jersey. It's got cedar trees and sphagnum bogs and everything's swampy and there was a mosquito biting me. And I'm like, this felt like home, right? And I look down and lo and behold, I see little green feces. And that's like the characteristic telltale sign of bog lemmings is they have this bright green poop, little poop pellets and they're bright green. And I look down and I was like, no way, right? And I'm like, of course there would be the Northern version of a bog lemming in this northern version that looks just like New Jersey, right? Um, and that's because there are these Arctic relics and so they moved, right? Um, and they were able to do that because the North America was a contiguous habitat for them, right? They were able to go to patches um, along the way and then when they receded, right? Um, and then over time, over tens of thousands of years, they've speciated into two, the Northern version and the Southern version. Although again, good luck telling the difference. Um, but they, you know, they have these two different, but they're part of the same genus, and they're the only species within that genus in North America, right? So it's really interesting to see how they adapted to change. However, um, they can't really do that anymore. As our climate changes, there's a big problem, and that's the fact that our content, continent isn't contiguous anymore, right? Where the bog lemming used to be able to run across North America, it's now gonna come into places like Chicago, right? Where it can't possibly get through the city of Chicago, right? It can't possibly get through a baseball field, right? Um, there's been research to show that a single trail through a forest will stop the movement of mice across that trail. Um, they won't jump it because of the predation risk of being out in the open. Um, and so when the species that used to be able to run with the glaciers and move around as climate change to find their ideal climate at that time, they can't do that anymore. There's highways in the way, right? There's cities in the way, there's suburbia in the way. Um, and so what we find is that these species don't utilize these urbanized or anthropogenic habitats the way they used to. Um, and that's a problem for the next time we have a regular, you know, natural Milankovitch cycle occur um, or a sped up Milankovitch cycle because of increased greenhouse gases, right? We know that these cycles are increasing because we have uh, more reflective surfaces, we have more um, heat absorbing gases in our atmosphere. And so the cycles are happening faster, right? And, and the swing is bigger. Um, and so, but the species can't move the same way they used to. Um, this study here um, showed what kind of animals they were able to find across an urban landscape in different types of green spaces. So they created four categories, right? They decided to look at city parks, which is A, golf courses, which is B, um, cemeteries, right? Big open spaces, which is C, um, and D, which is a city park, right? A natural area. Um, and what types of mammals they actually saw there. Um, and in our natural area, they were able to see coyotes, they were able to see foxes, they were able to see um, possums and deer, right? And all of those normal urban wildlife that you would see. But when you look at the city park, all you saw was a bunny and a cat, right? And you could see, you know, in a golf course, the coyotes and the raccoons used it, the foxes too, but not really anything else. Um, and, and the cemeteries weren't used by things like coyotes as much, right? Um, and, and things like that. And again, this is one of those articles that's linked um, on the shared document page, is that mammalian diversity on the next Milankovitch cycle won't be able to move the way that it did 20,000 years ago, right? And the big difference is because 20,000 years ago, we didn't have cities and parking lots. Um, and so when we think of our impact on the climate and our impact on 
uh, diversity, we think of things like fishing nets, right? Straws, right? Everybody hates a straw. Nobody uses straws anymore. If you, if you use a straw, you hate sea turtles, right? Um, but the bigger problem, right, is that we can't get rid of our parking lots. And so our climate is changing. It naturally changes no matter what, because we haven't yet figured out how to stop the earth from rotating, which I hope we don't. Um, but um, that's going to happen. And so we're going to have a lot of mammal species diversity issues when the mammals can't follow the climate the way that they used to. Um, and we're seeing all kinds of other changes too. Um, the climate impacts on some of these species assemblages. So this is kind of a, an obscure example. I'm, I wanted to put this out there because I love muskox. Um, and when I went to Alaska, I was able to see muskox and they were super cute, um, super angry too. I love animals that are super angry. Um, and so um, they have a natural lungworm in them. It doesn't hurt them, right? And they can also have a natural two different types of lungworms, right? One that only inhabits musk, muskox and one that can also impact caribou. And when they looked at this, the, the life cycle of this parasite involves a, sl a slug, right? It has to, the species and eggs have to go through a slug to get back in the muskox. It doesn't hurt the muskox at all, but it just kind of occurs, but it could occur in other species. So it's something that they're looking at. But when you look at it, the time right, from 1980, if you look at this map here, 1980, the dark red was where they had the most transmission of this lungworm, and light red is where they had the least transmission of the lungworm. But if you look down at 2017, the transmission of those lungworms is increasing northerly because climate is getting warmer, and so it's affecting more regions of muskox, and it's expanding its ability to impact other species. And so we might start seeing some downsides to this lungworm um, in other species, right? Like caribou, which can get um, the other um, lungworm uh, that muskox carry. And so we can see that that, that might be a problem. Um, and then one that hits a little closer to home is this is the life cycle of Lyme disease, right? Um, and so I'm gonna get my pen out again. Um, so Lyme disease, right, is usually called is usually thought to be associated with deer, but it's not. Um, Lyme disease is a bacteria called Borrelia um, that inhabits that actually infects um, black-legged ticks, right? And so we're going to start here at the eggs of the black-legged tick, right? Um, the eggs hatch into larvae, and those larvae are not infected, right? Their first host that they feed off of is usually squirrels, mice, or birds. And they are the ones that are the reservoir of that Borrelia bacteria. So then when the larvae feed on the squirrel or the mouse, they become infected with Borrelia. And then that larva, right, molts into a nymph. And when that nymph feeds on its secondary host, it is already infected and reinfects mice and squirrels and birds. And then that nymph, Right, when it drops and molts right, into an adult, that's the only point in its life cycle that it can actively infect a human or a deer um, because that's the only time when its jaws are strong enough to hold on long enough to give you the bacteria. Um, and so then that infected adult would bite into a deer or a human, right? Um, humans tend to be dead end hosts um, and deer tend to, be, uh, tend to be able to drop those adult females back off. Um, and start the cycle all over again. Um, and so what I, I would like to point out here right, is that Lyme disease is more tied to rodents, right, than it is to deer. Um, but if you look at this life cycle, it's dependent on the, the distribution of these, you know, primary hosts. And so when you look at the distribution of the ticks and their primary hosts, right, you have in 2001, this type of a distribution, and in 2000, uh, what is that, 14, I think, 2014, you can see a much stronger distribution, right? And what we're seeing is the, not the range of those hosts of squirrels and mice changing, but actually the ability for those ticks to survive winter because winters aren't as harsh as they used to be. Um, and so with that climate change, the map we see down here is the predicted establishment of black-legged ticks into Canada through 2030. So the dark region being where they found black-legged ticks the first time in 2009, 
and then where we expect black ticks, black legged ticks to go because of climate change. Um, and so, you know, this has kind of an impact, I think, on all of us. Um, and when we think of mammal diversity and, and how diseases are transmitted um, and how um, different impacts are to our local wildlife and, and us as a, as a side result, um, just kind of what that's about. Um, so I'm just gonna stop there. Uh, let me clear this out. Um, and, you know, just kind of say if anybody has any questions, um, thanks for listening and I'll be happy to take any questions uh, that you might have. And there's my email in case you want to email me. Perfect, thank you, Alicia. Uh, if we have questions, we'll get to them a little bit at the end, um, but let's see here. Uh, Evelyn, are you there? I see okay. you, there you go. Hi, Evelyn. All right, Evelyn. Now, Evelyn is going to uh, show us, has selected a few works from uh, the exhibition. Uh, we're gonna take a look at those right now. So I'm gonna share my screen here. First of all, Alicia, I really found your talk very interesting and I'd love to be in your classroom because <laughs> you're a great presenter. I'd like everyone to just take a few deep breaths, close their eyes. Open your eyes and we'll start on the art part of this. Uh, you're looking at a ceramic piece by an artist, Paula Wintercourt. You can see she lived from 1936 to 2018. It's called Shattered Ice. She was very influenced by cal calving glaciers. Uh, she visited Greenland and Iceland and she worked from memory. She's very into as you can see, this is very much about form and space. The next one is by Pat Martin. It's a collage called Floating Reef. It's a pastel background, which takes a lot of work to uh, build up the glares of color. And then she uh, Xerox photographed um, pieces of twine and ropes, cut them out and collage them onto this piece. Pat is an artist who's very interested in working with materials. And this whole exhibit is about material. Matt, do you wanna to go to the next slide? And these slides are uh, Janet Filomino. And of course you can see as the sea rises, she uses various materials. As you can see she used acrylic, ink, uh, some of them have mica in them. She was influenced by uh, also melting glazers, rising seas, and the, and the challenges of paint. She works in methods similar to Helen Frankenthaler and Jackson Pollock. Just concentrate on the gesture in these, which is I'm not gonna interpret, interpret them for you, but I'm gonna point out that there's a lot of uh, pouring and flinging on li of liquids on canvas. She works on the, these are worked on the floor. They're exceptionally large pieces. As you can see, they're six feet by six feet. Think about the red. Why did she place the red? What does the red do when you think about it? Red is a very bold color. It comes forward to, in your vision and blue colors tend to recede. Look at the variations of blues that she achieves. And some of this is very random and experimental, but she works hard to get the organic forms that she has. So I encourage you to come and visit this exhibit it's a lot about materials. Uh, they're all women artists, which is nice. And there's a lot of diversity here. So please come and visit us.
and I'll be glad to answer any questions. Great. Thank you, Evelyn. Sorry, I do you have more to say about um, the first slide? I, I accidentally clicked. Through. Yeah, I do. <laughs> Here, let's let's try it again. Here, let's get let's get um, this back um, up here. Sorry. Yeah, I was kind of caught. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Here we go. Here, let's let's. That's try that's all right. It's maybe the fun of it. So, she's working in porcelain, which mm -hmm. is a strong material, but also can shatter quite easily. And she's relating to the shattering of the uh, glaciers. Now, I've only seen glaciers in Iceland and Chile. And it happens all the time. A piece breaks off, it makes this loud noise and they float along. And notice the light and the dark sides of these, the, the three dimensionality, also the texture of these are very important and the shadows that they give off. And depending upon how you're viewing it, the shadows of course look differently. And it's a, just a, a very, um, very nice piece. Fantastic. Now, if you have, uh, let's see here. If you have questions, are there any questions for either of our presenters? Um, we can take those now um, in the chat. Um, Bruce has a question here. Um, discuss prohibition of deer in Bucks County in relationship to climate change. For climate change done improvements, so I guess the issue attract. Um, the question is uh, discuss the proliferation of deer in Bucks County in the relationship to climate change. Alicia, do you have any uh, thoughts about that? Uh, well, there are a lot of deer in Bucks County, that's for sure. <laughs> Thank um, you for validating that <laughs> observation that I think we all have. Validate. Um, I don't know how much it has to do with climate change. Um, and I think that it has a lot more to do with predation um, and the lack of natural predators in the region. Um, believe it or not, uh, Pennsylvania once had no deer. Um, at one point we extirpated all of our deer. Um, we shot them all and ate them. Um, and then we had to put them back. Um, and so in the early 1900s, we put them back. And so all the deer we have now are not actually our, our native deer to PA. I think we, we stole these from Canada or something. Um, and so their deer in general are used to, you know, having predation caps, right? So as herbivores, they'll continue to grow, right? Unless they run out of food or something eats them, right? Or there's disease, right? And disease doesn't usually come into play until they're highly overpopulated. Um, and so as part of the North American model for wildlife management, um, what we do is attempt to maintain um, stable and healthy populations of deer. And so we don't want them to get to the point at which they starve, right? Or that there's so many of them that they um, succumb to disease. Um, but there's a lot of them because there's no native coyotes. Well, there's a lot of coyotes, but they don't really eat the deer as much um, as they should. Uh, we don't have wolves and, and mountain lions anymore. Um, and we have a lot of really open spaces for them. They adapt really well to eating any kind of vegetation. So they should be eating our native shrubs, but they prefer the hostas. Um, and, you know, if you ever want to attract deer to your property, just plant some hostas. Um, they're like deer lettuce. Um, but, you know, it's it's more of a factor of lack of, of predation um, and you know, especially in Bucks County, we have a lot of regions where we can't have normal hunting um, because of proximity to development. Um, and so we have a lot of areas that are great deer areas, um, but we can't hunt in. Um, and so the only natural predators left if we can't take out the hunters are the cars. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's that, that issue more than, than climate change. Yeah. And 
Um, I mean, I was really interesting what you said, Alicia, about the, um, you know, these environments that are built by people really sort of trapping and preventing any sort of migration, either seasonally or long term by these animals. I mean, imagine that's the same way for deer and roads, right? It's hard for them to cross those. Um, well, no, they can cross them pretty easily. Um, unlike a unlike a mouse um, that will see an open road as a way for a hawk to get them or an owl to get them. The deer are not worried about anything anymore. Um, deer are not even really all that um, afraid of human interaction anymore. They used to be able to honk a horn and scare a deer out of the road. Now they just kind of look at you. Um, and, you know, the idea of the deer not being able to smell you when you go out to hunt and rubbing decentifier on you. Um, a deer in Bucks County most certainly knows what a human smells like and doesn't see it as a problem because most humans it encounters don't shoot them. They go, oh, look, and they take a picture. Um, and so they're not really afraid of human scent anymore. Um, so there's nothing really to stop them from wandering across open lawns and just kind of hanging out in your backyard. Um, so that's, that's part of it. That's why there's so many. They're not, there's plenty of food. There's nothing to scare them. There's nothing to, to stop them from the stress of predation is actually seen to be one of the integral factors to reducing population because a stressed female doesn't usually reproduce. Right. Um, and so we found that with our studies of wolves and, um, wolves and elk out in Yellowstone, that if you take the wolves out of the equation, the elk reproduce more because they're not as stressed and not as food limited. So you reintroduce the wolves and they get stressed out. Um, they abort fetuses because of stress um, and they abort fetuses because of lack of food because they're too busy cowering from the wolves to go eat. Um, and so our deer in Bucks County are not stressed. They're just hanging out and chilling. Um, and so they're having twins all the time um, and deer particularly are very social animals. And so they'll live in high densities. Um, you know, the herds can get bigger and bigger. They don't seem to mind. Um, and deer adopt like nobody's issue. Like if they find, if you find a dead, uh, a dead mother and there's a fawn nearby, the best thing to do is just wait because another mother will come by and be like, wanna come? And just take the deer with her. There, I've saw, I've, I've had on camera traps, um, a mother, a doe walk by with six fawns and there absolutely no way she had six fawns, right? Um, but they just pick them up and they just take them with them. Um, so it's not even a factor of if, you know, a mother goes down her offspring for the year go down. No, nah, somebody else picks up the offspring and keeps going. Wow. Um, when I talked to wildlife rehabbers out in um, Dublin, um, they had a pen of deer and the way they would release them back, like if, if they got fawns in that were hit by a car or something, they'd release them back by just leaving them in the pen and taking down the fence um, because the adult deer would just kind of come by, pick one out like they're at the supermarket and hop away with it. Um, so um there's really nothing to limit the deer in bucks county oh we'll have to have another program that's all about bucks county deer which i think would be very popular <laughs> everything uh, wrong with bucks county deer yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, bruce had another question uh, and maybe evelyn this you can jump in here um was the selection of women artists for climate for the rising tides on purpose or does this issue attract more women artists? I will jump here and here and say that the selection of, of the artists for um, Rising Tides was in part because that uh, to coincide with um, uh, this year's 100th celebration yeah. of the 13th Amendment. Um, but Evelyn, I, looking at this show, was there anything in there, any connections that you found between these different art pieces, between these different artists? Well, a, a lot, of course, it's all about water. Mm -hmm. And um, Emily Brown is well known for her ink, ink paintings, her large ink paintings. And she also did a glass piece there. I think the common connection is interest in the environment. Mm -hmm as both the ceramic people had strong influences 
we're strong influenced by the environment and the ocean. Uh, Emily Brown has always worked with water. And uh, Pat Martin, of course, has always been on the ecological edge of things. So I think that was a lot to do with the selection of the artists. Mm -hmm. And which of the ones in this exhibition, for those who haven't seen it yet, Evelyn, what, um, what, you know, what is something that maybe struck out for you um, when you went and saw it um, that you might it would encourage other people to see it when they go check it out? Well, there's the way the exhibit's laid out is beautiful. I mean, I have to really give the curatorial staff a really thumbs up on the way it's presented. There is a piece in the back on the wall, a ceramic piece with a video yeah. that is about the ocean and animals. And this artist has done extensive research for this piece. It's something, unfortunately, we can't show on the screen. It's not that easy to do, but I really think that's something well worth going and seeing. It's innovative, it's current technology, and her ceramic work is flawless. Fantastic. Thank you, Evelyn. I, I want to jump in here and say this is a great spot for us to uh, finish up. Uh, in people, everyone in the audience, we're going to have our last virtual climate talk with uh, Melissa Langston, who's another DelVal professor, next Tuesday, same time at 1 p.m. And that program will feature Margarita Hagen, who is the artist whose piece right. you're talking about. Yeah. Um, Evelyn. So if you're interested in learning more about Margarita and her work and that piece and hearing more about um, how science and climate change are interacting, please join us next uh, Tuesday uh, at 1 p.m. It's the same time, same place, same great uh, team here. So with that, I also want to make sure I, I corrected myself. It was the 19th Amendment that gave women the right to vote, which we're celebrating this year in 2020. Right. Um, but I wanna take this moment one last time to thank everyone who came today. I wanna to thank Alicia, thank you so much. Evelyn, thank you so much for donating your time today. Uh, and until we can see each other again, please everyone stay safe, stay healthy uh, and stay arty, okay? Enjoy your Tuesdays, everyone. We'll see you later. Thank you. Bye. Bye.